Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a quick 30-minute webinar on how to optimize your tech hiring process. My name is Chelsea, and I will be your webinar producer today. If this is your first webinar with us, then welcome. CodeSignal is the leading technical interview and assessment solution, helping the world go beyond the noise of technical recruiting with smarter questions, a simpler process, and a stronger platform. In today's webinar, we will be exploring how to simplify and streamline your tech hiring process in an unbiased way that ensures you are not missing any great candidates. We'll leave time at the end of the webinar to address any of your questions, which can be submitted in the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If we do not have time to answer your question, we will personally follow up with you after the webinar. And lastly, we will be sending out the webinar recording in the coming days. Without further ado, let's get started. Ellen, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Ellen Markman. I'm Cozadol's Director of Recruiting. Uh, I have spent most of my career focused on hiring tech talent, and I love talking about recruiting processes and strategy. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Uh, so let's jump right in. So hiring engineers is hard. Uh, that's always been true, but I think recently it seems to be getting harder. Uh, I think maybe the uncertain economic climate has raised the stake a little bit. Uh, our hiring partners are facing increased pressure to deliver. So. They really want to see the best of the best when they have roles open. And um, all of these tech layoffs have brought an influx of very strong candidates to the talent market. Um, so to me, lately, the, the challenge seems to be finding better than ever candidates for our roles uh, without interviewing every single person in this newly flooded candidate pool. Um, so for us as recruiting partners, delivering value uh, in an environment like this means optimizing our hiring processes for more efficient candidate selection uh, and better interview practices. Um, because we really can't push through this challenging period by simply interviewing more. Uh, interviewing takes time from our engineering teams and every hour that an engineer spends interviewing is an hour that they don't spend shipping products uh, and solving our customers' problems. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about how I optimize CodeSignal's internal hiring processes um, and open the floor to get your ideas as well. So to, to kind of level set, I want to start by defining three of the broad challenges that we face in technical recruiting. Um, first, most of the technical hiring processes that I've been part of are extremely time consuming for engineering teams. Uh, we often rely on engineers as subject matter experts to create interview content, uh, to conduct the interviews, to review and judge candidates' performance. Um, that kind of process can, can really only handle so many candidates before our engineers are just overloaded. Uh, and even if we eliminate some of the interview hours with an automated assessment, we still need engineers to spend time creating the questions for that assessment, evaluating candidate responses, uh, and coming up with new content in case it leaks. Another big issue is that hiring processes uh, for technical roles can feel very biased and unfair, especially um, when subjective human evaluation heavily impacts decisions. For example, uh, different interviewers sometimes evaluate the same behavior differently, with one interviewer maybe shrugging off something like sloppy variable names, uh, but another interviewer uh, severely penalizing the same behavior. Uh, or interviewers might ask questions inconsistently. So one interviewer might provide hints, uh, another interviewer might not, or the same interviewer might provide hints to some candidates, but not others. Uh, and finally, some of our processes for all the work that we put in them just are not generating meaningful signals. So uh, we might over-index our evaluation on something like, for example, uh, candidates, algorithms, and data structure knowledge, because it's it's easy to evaluate in, a, in an interview environment, um, but fail to measure other equally job relevant skills, which can result in us hiring candidates who are exceptional on lead code, but not actually all that good in their new jobs. So these challenges pop up uh, as various pitfalls in our recruiting processes, and I'm going to highlight three of those pitfalls and talk about how I've mitigated them at CodeSignal. The first pitfall I want to talk about is missing out on great candidates due to manual resume review. 
which often stems from a desire to save engineering time by narrowing the candidate pool using a recruiting team filter at the top of the funnel. So um, the problem here is that resume review doesn't necessarily give you a better candidate pool than the unfiltered group started with. And I think you know sometimes you might even unwittingly filter out your strongest candidates if they don't look like your strongest candidates on paper. And it can be very challenging to identify strong engineering candidates based on their resumes. I think it, this is especially true with the entry level talent pool. Uh, because you know, candidates' careers are just getting started and there is uh, very little professional experience to differentiate one resume from another. Some companies solve for this by establishing a target schools list for campus recruiting, but it's, that's not really a solution. That's just more like an arbitrary restriction of, of your candidate pool. Um, and you know, even with more experienced uh, technical candidates' resumes, it's not necessarily easier to read them. Uh, technical accomplishments that are super obvious in a code base don't always translate that well to a written resume. Uh, and senior candidates might be able to focus more on the business impact of technical contributions, but uh, you know, junior or mid-level engineers, especially those in larger organizations, don't always have the visibility to uh, represent their, their work in a way that would stand out on a resume. And recruiters uh, might not have the technical expertise required to parse engineering resumes. So Resume review can, can easily devolve into just like a manual keyword search. So uh, recruiters might be able to identify all the candidates who mention having experience with a particular technology, uh, but they might not be able to pinpoint the candidates who most deeply understand or, or can best apply that technology. So to truly boost efficiency and to make sure that you're not missing anyone great, uh, top of funnel reviews should be based on objective skill metrics, not resumes or, or other proxies. Uh, I recommend switching to some kind of technical assessment, ideally not one that you have to create and manage in-house, uh, since, uh, as I mentioned previously, that is pretty time consuming if, uh, if your in-house engineers have to manage the content uh, and grade the, the submissions. In CodeSignal's recruiting team, we are very lucky because we have access to CodeSignal's own solutions, and so uh, we make use of uh, our own highly reliable, uh, very well-validated pre-screen assessments for many of our engineering pipelines. Uh, my team might still do like a cursory resume review for, for some like, experience level, but uh, we never spend much time on resume review and we really rely on uh, a, a proven sort of skills evaluation framework um, to give us our first real indicator of a candidate's job relevant qualifications. And, and this is very helpful because we can then really prioritize the best candidates for later stage interviews and uh, uh, save significant engineering hours. The second pitfall, and this often follows from the first, is uh, too many engineering hours wasted on early stage technical interviews. So, as I mentioned, I often start CodeSignal's engineering process with a top of funnel pre-screen assessment, uh, which gives us an objective measure of candidates' job relevant skills and helps us determine the best and brightest candidates to advance. Uh, and this definitely saves engineering hours, uh, but pre-screen assessments uh, aren't really right for every pipeline. That kind of hands-off interview stage, that works great when you're hiring more junior engineers who might have you know, multiple processes to juggle and they aren't usually interviewing for highly specialized roles. Um, they probably don't expect a ton of one-on-one -on -one interaction with the hiring team in early interview stages. Um, those candidates are, are often happy to tackle uh, and often prefer a take-home assessment on their own time. Uh, but when we're recruiting senior and staff level talent, uh, that sort of take-home assessment isn't always a great fit. These candidates tend to be more entrenched in their current roles, so they might be passive job seekers who, who are sourced, but uh, even direct applicants who want to make a switch, at that more senior level, they're you know, aware that there's a risk to, to leaving behind a large body of work and a strong reputation at their, at their current employer. So um, for senior engineering pipelines, uh, our interview process needs to be high touch and personalized so that we can build candidates' confidence and, and promote engagement. 
that's why I think that's why a lot of companies senior engineering processes include a face-to-face -face interview with a member of the hiring team at every interview stage. Uh, but at my organization, at least, that's just really not practical. The more uh, senior and specialized the candidate pool, the fewer qualified interviewers we have to assess them. And so we have to be very judicious with our interviewers' limited bandwidth. Uh, if I fill interviewers' calendars with early stage technical interviews, they burn out before they ever meet the candidates who are much more likely to actually get offers um, at the on site and later stage interviews. So even for very senior candidates, I try to reserve internal interviewers for the very last stage of the process. Um, but where does that leave me? Um, I solve for this with CodeSignal's tech screen product. Tech screen assessments are driven by the same um, research fact skills evaluation frameworks as our take home pre-screen assessments. So the results are uh, equally reliable and um, give me the same measure of technical competency, but they're administered by a live person during a scheduled video interview, which gives them more of that red carpet feel. Um, and this saves our internal interviewers a ton of time, but it also provides that kind of high touch can experience that, that I'm going for. Finally, uh, an incredibly common pitfall that can lead to biased evaluation standards and, and poor hiring decisions is unstructured on-site interviews. This is a pitfall I have encountered many, many times in my recruiting career, and I think it's another one that stems from a desire to save time. It feels so much easier and, and faster to spin up an unstructured on-site interview plan than a structured one. Um, because it just takes a lot less work to get off the ground. For busy hiring managers, there's just this understandable temptation to kind of throw together like a handful of interviewers and assign each of them some some area to focus on and just like call it a day. Um, but the thing is that kind of interview process is faster to get off the ground, as I said, but it doesn't, it's not actually faster. Like it doesn't really reduce your time to hire um, because once you have a few candidates in process, it it's, quickly obvious that your unstructured interview content doesn't allow for full confidence in the interview results. So that stymies decision making, it delays your hire. It delays making a hire. Um, if you don't have consistent scoring and, and standardized evaluation criteria, it's very hard to judge candidates against anything except for one another. Uh, so hiring teams are likely to default to a comparative hiring model, waiting until they have several candidates through interviews and then evaluating candidate performance on a curve. So uh, unstructured interview processes leave us vulnerable to poor hiring decisions. Um, members of the interview panel are often left to their own devices to come up with interview questions if the process isn't well structured. Uh, and interviewers tend to be most comfortable assessing candidate skills in their own areas of expertise. So if the interviewer panel has an overlapping skill set, like they're all members of the same team, for instance, those common skills might get overemphasized in the candidate evaluation, um, while the skills that aren't well represented on the team, which you know could be equally important for job performance, get overlooked. And you know, if, if interviewers are left to come up with their own questions, if there's not like a, a, a standardized question bank, um, and clear grading standards, interviewers' personal biases can, can creep into these subjective evaluations. And interviewers uh, might ask questions that are not really relevant to the requirements of the job. Because biases are often unconscious, they're, they're very hard to avoid, um, and we all have them. So it's really important to take precautions to uh, prevent them from impacting evaluations. Um, and biases are far less likely to influence interviewer feedback when each candidate is, is, is asked the same questions in the same way, and all candidates are evaluated against the same performance criteria, which are established before you meet any candidates. I am forever iterating to improve the structure and quality of CodeSignal's on-site engineering interviews, um, but we do have a pretty tight process, um, as we should, given our access to uh, professional assessment developers and, uh, and IO psychologists. Um, but 
Kita's effort was ease of implementation. So I, I tried to make it almost as easy for engineering hiring managers to establish a rigorous, highly structured interview process as it would be for them to just vote it in. Um, so I have two big tips on, on how to do this at your own organizations. The first is to try to create modular sessions. So um, a lot of engineering roles have skills in common. So if you can define some of those fundamental competencies and build sessions around them, hiring managers can mix and match those, uh, those fundamental competency sessions with more specialized content. And it's very worth it to um, build question banks and evaluation rubrics and uh, interviewer pools around fundamental competency sessions since they'll be reused in so many, in so many different processes. Uh, at Code to Know, we have three of these. Uh, we have one for data structures and algorithms, one for software design, and one for refactoring. Uh, interviewers for these sessions come from across the engineering organization. So uh, incorporating these sessions in on-site interviews helps us avoid over-indexing our evaluations on the hiring team's current skill set. Uh, my second tip is to encourage experiential interviews. So when, uh, when hiring teams are making up their own new interview content, uh, try to get them to do, to create experiential interviews. So these are the interviews that mimic actual job tasks in like a, a, a real work environment. Um, and they give you a much stronger signal than situational or hypothetical interviews, uh, which are those interviews that are that are, have questions like, tell me about a time when, or, or how would you handle that kind of question? Uh, it's much easier to create a rubric for experiential interviews because you can test drive the interview content uh, with a team member who uh, you know is skilled in the competency that the question is designed to assess and then base the rubric on that person's performance. Um, it's a lot easier than, than trying to imagine what a good answer to uh, tell me about a time when might be. And um, this, this kind of interview, it, it, it's, uh, the biggest challenge with it is uh, making the environment truly realistic. Uh, for technical interviews, you know, if, if this often uh, means you have to provide an interview environment that that has all the tools and functionalities that candidates are used to uh, in their own local machine. So you have to sort of mimic a, a desktop IDE. So. Uh, You've now heard a ton from me about the pitfalls that I commonly see in tech recruiting, uh, what I do to combat those process hazards at Codesignal. I'd love to open this up for audience discussion. Um, do you see the same pitfalls? What do you do about them? What did I miss? Um, how, do you handle, how do you handle other pitfalls that you see? You guys can uh, submit your, your answers in the question and answer box if you'd like to. And just because we have some extra time, I thought we could send out the poll question. So let's hear from you. You can let us know which of the pitfalls that Ellen discussed trouble you the most. Give it a couple more minutes. All right, I'm starting to see the responses come in. Let's look at what it looks like. Ellen, is that surprising to you? Uh, that actually is surprising to me. I think my biggest uh, pitfall of these three is the unstructured on-site interviews. But actually, before I worked at Codesignal, I had the benefit of uh, access to all of our solutions, it was probably uh, it was probably wasting engineering hours on early stage technical interviews because there were a lot of processes that I was part of where uh, we would have we really would have so many candidates interviewing early on that we would burn our interviewers out before anyone got to on site. And while I had that poll question running, we received a few questions that I'll just get started with. 
Um, so the first one is, can you please describe an experiential interview in a bit more detail? Yes. So that is in, that's sort of like, um, uh, you could think of it as like a driving test. So rather than uh, asking a candidate, like, wh what do you do at a stop sign? You put them in a car and sit in the passenger seat and like take them to a road that has a stop sign and see if they stop for five seconds. Um, for like, if you think about it from a recruiting perspective, uh, if you were interviewing a tactical recruiter, um, you might do some kind of like mock resume, uh, read through and say like, you know, is this a good, does this candidate fit the profile for X, Y, Z role? Um, or you might have them read through some interview feedback and tell you if they think the candidate should proceed to the next stage or not. Uh, like try to, you know, try to have an interview that actually replicates a task that the candidate might do in their actual job. Thanks, Alan. The next question is, I have a team and a market that doesn't have a strong EB. Stakeholders are reluctant to do pairing or experiential interviews for fear of losing candidates who would who refuse. How would you address this? What's EB? Good question. Um, okay, but basically, like if you if candidates are not going to be all that excited about this role and they don't want to do, they don't want to do an experience. Like you're afraid that basically if you make the barrier to ent entry for your interview process too high, candidates are just going to drop out. Um, so this is actually a very uh, good employer brand. Okay, cool. Yep. Got it. Um, this is a good market. I think like, uh, the market is on your side at the moment. So uh, I would probably try it and just keep, like I would just track your data and see is the drop off rate any higher with a uh, with an experiential interview at the top of your funnel than it, uh, than it was previously. And are you, are the benefits outweighing any potential increase in drop off? You know, even if you're losing a few more candidates, are you saving a lot of time with your from your engineering interviewers because you're only meeting the best candidates on site and you're no longer having to interview every single person. Um, I think also you can position these types of interviews to candidates in a way that they are very excited about taking part in your interview process. And um, you gain a lot of credibility with candidates when you have an interview process that they can respect uh, and, and really, um, really conveys that you and your team know what the important skills for this job are and know understand what it takes to be successful in the role so i think um i i think that fear is really overblown uh so i would i would really advocate for a pilot test and you could you know you could limit the scope of the pilot test and say like all right let's just try this with 50 candidates or something like that um and then you know collect the data and demonstrate that it that you know you're either not seeing increased drop off, or if you are, that the benefits outweigh the the uh, minor candidate loss. But I, my 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 guess is that you are not going to see significantly more candidate drop off. I think candidates generally like being able to demonstrate their skills in a in a really um, uh, really work relevant si uh, situation. Thanks, Alan. The next question. Um is if you're not using a resume, then which is the best way to shortlist a candidate? So I, uh, so we use uh, the uh, CodeSignal pre-screens for the most part, we use CodeSignal tech screens for uh, more senior candidates, but you need some kind of uh, trusted evaluation that is giving you an objective skills measurement and the skills that you're measuring have to be relevant for the job. and it has to give you a range of scores. It can't just be like a binary pass fail. Um, and if you have a range of scores and you know that the skills that are being evaluated are relevant for success in the job and the evaluation is reliable. So, you know, if a candidate takes it twice, they get the same score um, and it's, you know, it's validated. So, you know, you know that it's, it's a really strong uh, predictor of job success 
then it's very easy to just shortlist. You know, you can just continue to make your shortlist shorter with the with the candidates who perform the best on that evaluation. Uh, that's a high bar. I think you know, uh, you, you likely need a vendor assessment for for that. Um, you could try codes and all, uh, but uh, I think you know if you're creating an assessment internally, it, it's a lot. It's a lot harder to. Um, to create one that you can feel really confident in, just because you know it's nobody's it's nobody's full time job to be uh, to be creating and monitoring that content, and and it's it will likely leak, and then um, it takes a little while to like create new content to rotate in. Um, so that I uh, you know if you're creating it internally, I still think it's better than resume review because you are getting you know you can still make sure that the skills that you're evaluating are are relevant for success in the job, um, and you can still uh, Give it a score range so that you can, you know, shortlist your best candidates. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, like you just have to accept that it won't be quite as reliable as um, an assessment from a vendor, where it's a whole bunch of people's full time job to be creating and monitoring uh, and validating assessment content. All right, and this might be the last question we can get to, and we might need a little more context on this. But the question is. How do you handle technical interviews for the non-experienced people? Oh, like for, for entry level candidates? I think so. So um, so entry level candidates tend to do really well uh, in a lot of the uh, data structures and algorithms type of interviews because uh, they recently learned that in school. Um, where they don't always do as well uh, uh, are more of the like the refactoring type of interviews where they're looking at an existing code base and trying to make it better. Um, but in my experience, software engineering candidates typically have internship experience. So they have, you know, like some uh, some experience working in a professional code base. Um, and so I think, you know, you have to be really clear on what your expectations are for an entry level employee. They obviously can't be the same as someone who's, you know, worked in a variety of professional settings and, and has dealt with multiple different, uh, you know, massive uh, production systems. But I, I think if you um, are realistic and clear about what you expect entry level candidates to or entry level uh, employees to do, you can create an interview process that. Uh, that is true to those to those job responsibilities, um, and and you know you might find uh, that entry level candidates outperform experienced candidates in certain facets of your uh, of your assessment, namely those data structures and algorithms, the things that they just learned in school. Um, they typically have a little bit more of that kind of theoretical knowledge. All right, thanks, Ellen, um, and thanks to our attendees for joining us. We hope that you found this session uh, informational and you've got some actionable insights and strategies that you can apply to your own technical hiring process. We hope to see you at our next webinar on how to optimize your tech hiring questions. And if you have any additional questions or you want to follow up with us offline, please just send me an email uh, and we can follow up with you directly. And that concludes our webinar for today. So have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone.